Hello and welcome to another Lighthouse Video MANA podcast. For those of you just joining, I'm Pastor Jeff Glenn and it's my pleasure to take you through the Word each week and to find some encouragement and some instruction and if needed, um, some um, correction. And so um, we've been going through Genesis and last week we went through Genesis 7. We saw this was where God implemented judgment on the earth due to the continual wickedness that was on the earth and in the heart of man. And God's judgment came in the form of a flood. This was a worldwide catastrophic event that left all but eight people, and depending on the type of animal, um, seven pairs of the animals were all that were left. They were um, carried along in the ark. And today we'll see the end of this flood where God begins to remove uh, the, the water from the world. And we see this in Genesis, well, so we'll read Genesis 8.1. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters subsided. And so it's curious to me why some words um, are used over others. You know, and, and for me, so I always have to consider, well, why is that? Why are certain words used um, over others? You know, and for me, I think, well, maybe a different word might have been a better way to convey the meaning, but that doesn't necessarily mean the translators, who, by the way, were, were much smarter and more dedicated. They had more time to agonize and consider which of the words they were going to translate from the ancient languages into other languages, which finally made their way into English, right? So, so a lot of time and effort has gone into that, that thought process of how do we best translate from the ancient languages to our modern languages in the Bibles that we have today. So I'm not saying that, those, that I'm any smarter than anyone. Um, I'm just saying that when I come across a word that I wonder why they chose that, I have to do the extra work to dig in there and, and figure out why that was and what, what they were trying to get at. And so um, it, it just takes a little bit of time to figure out why. And then you ask yourself, what was the author trying to convey? And so here in verse 1, we see the word remembered is, is one of those words we have to take a little bit of time to, to figure out what the author was trying to say. Because it, it can seem like that the author was saying that, that God forgot... And then suddenly remembered, like, oh, I flooded the earth and, and Noah and his family and all the animals are bobbing around on the sea somewhere out there in the world. And, and that's not exactly what's going on. But remembered is the word that's used. And it does mean to remember in the, in the classical sense of remembering. But it also has with it this, this meaning of to keep in mind or to not forget. And, you know, it's interesting. There's this cognitive trick that, that we can use when reminding ourselves or someone else to not forget something. Um, if you say, don't forget, um, your mind keys in on that, that phrase of forget and then whatever you say, don't forget, right? Um, but if you say, remember, then your mind keys in on the, on the word remember and whatever you're telling someone to remember, right? Remember to, to get the milk when you go to the store is much better than saying don't forget for some from for some cognitive reason in our brains that that um, we don't quite understand but but nonetheless um, has been shown at least in some studies to be to be true so I think that's part of what the word choice is here for right especially in the ancient language I think it's better to state God's actions and attributes in the positive rather than to say well God didn't forget Noah um, God remembered it was, was the phrase that was used. So at any rate, we, we don't serve an absent-minded God, right? God knows where his car keys are at at all times. And so God is faithful. 
The intent of the ark was to save Noah. We know that. It was to save Noah, his family, and all of the animals that God wanted to preserve. And so he, he brought them into the ark and closed them up and preserved them through this judgment. And so um, you know, the promise of the one who would come that would crush the head of the serpent, that was, that was at stake in this, in this flood. If he wouldn't have saved Noah and his family and, the, and all the rest, this wouldn't have happened. And so in the ark, we see God's provision. And, you know, this was the shelter that, that not only carried them through the flood, right, through the 40 days and the 40 nights of the flood, but it also uh, provided shelter for them afterwards. Uh, it was months and months after the rain stopped until Noah and his family actually were able to leave the ark. So once the, the rain stopped and the, the waters of the deep stopped giving up their water, it, it was months before the water subsided and rested on the mountain, and then it was even longer uh, before the earth dried out enough for them to, to step out. And that's where we see the, the raven being sent out who never came back, and then the dove who went out um, twice and finally returned with an olive branch that indicated to Noah that there was um, land and, and trees out there and that God's promise to preserve them had been kept. And it was even a few more weeks before they stepped out of the ark. So they used this ark for their shelter and for their provision long past just carrying them through the flood. And so um, you know, Noah didn't just fling the door open once the, the, wa the rain had stopped. Um, if he had, you know, they would have all been lost. And so in, in this waiting for the right moment, they remained hopefully dependent on God. They knew that God had put them in the ark for preservation and they waited for him to signal to them when the right time was for them to come out in, in, into this new world that had been um, deluged with this water. And so um, after departing the ark, Noah promptly sacrificed to God um, of every clean animal and every clean bird. And this was why he brought seven pairs of those along was for the sacrifice. And, and this sacrifice pleased God as we see in scripture, and then we see God vowing never to again curse the ground for man's sake. And we see all this here, in, even in the same thing, we see um, God's correct assessment of mankind even after the flood. We see that in verse 21, that um, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of a man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing. So it's sandwiched in this promise of I'm not going to curse the ground and I'm not going to destroy every living thing is, is God's assessment that the imagination of man's heart is, is evil from his youth. So if you are ever counseled to trust your heart or follow your heart, keep this passage in mind. Um, all of this, um, we see um, God's continued promise to provide for mankind in verse 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. And so the assurance here from God that what should, it was meant to comfort Noah and even us, that um, God, he's gonna provide for our needs. And that includes you and that includes me and that should be incredibly encouraging, especially in these times when, when there's all sorts of uncertainty and craziness going on. No, we have God's word that, that while the earth remains, these things will remain as well. And they shall not cease because we serve a mighty, awesome God. And so I hope that's encouraging you. Stay encouraged and stay in the word.